My name is Evren Adiorek. I am the Director of Product Management for Data Analytics. And I am so delighted to have all of you here. And I have two guest speakers with me, Remy and Sergey, who are going to join us. Uh, they've been a fantastic use case, and they're going to share their experience with all of you. Uh, without further ado, I want to talk to you about a little about uh, data and what's happening with the data. How many of you have seen the study? By 2025, core of the data created globally will be real time in nature. Core of the data. That's a lot of data, guys. And this is not much time. So we got to think about what we're going to do to be ready for real time data analytics. What's driving this? Who doesn't have a cell phone right now? That's good, no hands. So we're all using, you're taking pictures. Now it's getting processed, right? It's gone through the clouds. You're using it for buying stuff. I know I'm doing it. And I know how I'm being utilized with my data. All the communications we're doing it. Think about all the manufacturing, what everybody's doing. All the data we're generating at all times. Media, manufacturing, enterprise, personal, shopping, what have you, everywhere. The common thread is, I want to create a data-driven organization. Who doesn't want to create a data-driven organization today? We have chief data officers, chief digital officers. They're all tasked to establish a data-driven organization. OK, let's talk about what that means. But keep that in mind, right? What happens in this data-rich environment? Who doesn't buy stuff online today, right? When you make a purchase, you probably saw an advertisement somewhere, and then you decided to go after it, you click on it, and then you create some data right there. Either you bought it or you're considering it. If you bought it, you're going to ship it, you share some of your information with your uh, whoever the uh, purchasing that uh, you did it. On the other end, we have the inventory systems in place for you. We have the financial systems for you so you can make your payments, so you can tra track it, and so forth. In addition, all the other marketing systems are generating data around it. I know this. I've been buying stuff for my younger son. He decided to build his own uh, scooter. I never knew anything about the axles, different sizes of axles. Now I know. And all the targeted ads that I'm getting about it, this is a better product and so forth, I'm trying to help him with that. Thanks to you guys. What happened? They actually recognized my need. They knew what I was trying to do. They knew where I was making my uh, searches. They knew the types of searches that I made from the categories. All that information is in there through, driven by the events that I triggered. Take a look at the things that I evaluated, this versus that. Take a look at the decision that I made, what I wanted to purchase, what I didn't want to purchase, and how I came to that point. And what I did after I purchased, which happened three times, I bought the wrong thing. I sent it back. It was a whole event-driven system. Who is doing the online gaming today? I am not one of them. My sons are. My older son, it turns out, is one of the online gamers. He's racing. He's actually pretty good. He's not making enough money yet, but he's going to get there. And this is a big event. So what happens there? The time played, which we limit how much they play during school days. But they, the system knows how much time they're putting in there, how they're progressing. Is he get, becoming a better driver or not? And his age, all the IP addresses, all that information, again, it triggers all the back-end systems about what we do and how we deal with it. In this case, what are the types of events we're dealing with? Did he beat the regular bots? Is he really beating people when he races online, real people? How much time is he spending on that particular game? Or whether or not he is talking to his friends, which many products that they have online are enabled in enabling each other to really talk to one another, and they decide what they should buy. I know it because I get an alert. They just bought this online using my credit card. OK, how did that happen? Right? But that's all driven by the events that we're actually pushing forward. So what happened to my 
I want to create data-driven organization. Maybe I want to create an event-driven organization, right? That's what we want to get to, maybe. That's probably the path that we want to go to. Or are they exclusive? If you look at it, they're not exclusive. One feeds the other one. I, I love the positioning in here. Take a look at what we're trying to do with the strategic vision that actually drives the operational priorities. If I am the CEO, if I am the chief operating officer of a manufacturing plant, I know what I need to be building, I know what I need when, that will really actually help me drive my priorities tactically, operationally, while I am actually driving my strategy. Those timelines are different. Those characteristics might be common in some cases, from use case to use case, but timelines are different. Sensitivities are different. On the strategic decision, I can actually take my time to do my segmentation. But when I'm actually buying something, I have to make that decision. I have to make sure that I am targeting the right person. Yeah, everyone was trying to buy this part for the scooter. I'm going to pop that one in here because that's what he's searching for, not something for his wife. That's the decision that we need to get to. There are really interesting dynamics going on in here, but both of the decisions that we're making, short term and long term, are driven from these sets of data. Time is very critical in here. Time you spent between what you have decided to buy to what you buy and how you can actually add more value is very important. And we're still dealing with the same sort of data, but the scale is different. Decision making is a little different. How do we address this ever so getting smaller window of opportunity to turn it into a right decision so that Purchasing is done, decisions are made, critical decisions are made. Some of these things, uh, I'm joking in here, scooter buying is not a critical decision, but if you're running a manufacturing plant, if you're running an enterprise, every second matters on every decision that we make. Event activation is all about the speed. Speed of analytics, speed of action. That's what we're going to be talking about. This is what we're going, this is what we're seeing throughout the world, how things are moving there. Now, if you look at the traditional platforms, why are we struggling? Why is the trend towards real-time analytics, streaming analytics, decision-making is happening, yet the current traditional platforms are not able to do it? Well, one thing, we can't ingest the data fast enough let alone processing them, let alone really trying to really make the readily available data into the hands of the right people, and consider all the tool sets that are out there trying to tap into the set of data to make a decision. They're at best disconnected, not really relevant to one another. So when you look at the enterprise level, and I was a senior VP of uh, and a CTO of GE Healthcare at one point, and I know what a large-scale system globally means and how you make those decisions are very important and the need around ingestion, need around having a unified system for both batch and streaming is important. Serverless architecture is absolutely important. I'm sure you have all attended some parts of the serverless systems. A tools, having the right set of tools for the right set of decisions that you want to make is essential. And most importantly, flexibility for the users. Because we want to enable everyone to become a data analyst, analyst a strategic decision maker with the tool sets that we have in hand. Little bit about what we are doing on Google Cloud around stream analytics and how we are tackling them. Serverless architecture. Ingestion services, batch and stream processing, all unified, not one or the other, both with the same set of uh, code. Comprehensive set of analytics uh, tools, from your ML tools to TensorFlows to BigQueries, you name it. And 
all the flexibilities that you need. When I talk about ingestion, some of you may have heard, Cloud pops up. This is the largest scalable ingestion system that you can find. And it is very global, and I'll share with you, and my partners in here will share their experience as well and how they're doing it. Data flow is designed to handle both batch and stream needs, and you do it only once. You code it once, you do it for both of them. And that's how we are designing it. And we use all these internally within the Google family as well. And for all your analysis, you can use your CloudML, you can use your BigQuery. We're making it as easy as possible for you to uh, leverage. And open source, this is our, in our DNA. Everything we do, all of our engineers work in the world of open source. If you happen to be using one of these, the Kafka's, the Sparks, and Flinks, and so forth, they're all there. You can easily come and start using our tools. They're supported to help you achieve your real-time analysis world. So on Google Cloud, for your needs, when it comes to streaming analytics, you will find every tenant that makes it a reality for you. Serverless architecture, robust and global scalable ingestion systems, unified streaming and batch services, flexibility for all your users, and all the tools that you need for analysis. Now, some of you may have seen this slide. If you look at it on the left-hand side, look at the amount of time that we had to spend to add the value we want to get to a place where we're actually providing insights. We are actually providing some decision making, not really tinker with all the tunings and do I have the right set of data in here? Do I have the right connectors? Is it going to scale? Is it going to really have the right memories in place? In some cases, you run out of space, you run out of memory. This is all done in a very scalable, global way, automatically for you on our analytics platform. All of them are achieved through our serverless platform. It is key to your success. I mentioned pops up. Take a look at what you can achieve. How many of you have scales of 100 gigs of uh, seconds for the performances that you need globally scaled? And it actually simplifies how you do it. And the way that we do it is it integrates with the data processing simply very uh, integrated in the data flow so that it simplifies your experience going forward. That is key, and this is done in every region globally. So you can actually check that mark and say, I can access to my data, I can event, manage my events, I can do it at scale. Mentioned data flow. It is done in a way to unify both Batch and stream for you. Why is it important? Because we are already seeing the shortcomings of the skill sets. If you had to have a skill set who knows how to deal with batch versus stream, you're not going to be able to scale. This is done, it unifies it because batch is not going away. While the streaming is getting faster and growing faster, batch is not going away. Batch is there. We want to make sure you can take advantage of both with one set of code one set of tool sets, one set of skill sets. And it is integrated, fully integrated. I told you we believe in open source. Beam has, I'm so proud to mention in here, has won the technology award this year for all the abilities that it provided to the community. It is helping you build your use cases with your language choice to solve your problems at scale. If you haven't started using it, I encourage you to start playing with it. End-to-end, -end, a comprehensive platform from ingestion to storage to processing to analysis. This is what you will get from Google Cloud when you start working on your next generation problems and real-time problems and streaming problems. Some customers, and there's a ton in here, we're gonna talk about in detail about the AB Tasty in here, about Gojek, Okada, High Games, Recruit. These are examples just within the last six to nine months that are popping up in here. Because they are seeing, as soon as they start moving, 
and bringing their data using our tools. They're seeing the value, they're freely sharing this, and I'm so happy to mention them in here on the stage with, for all of you. Without stealing uh, your thunder, in the meantime, maybe, Remy, you wanna come next to me? I, I wanna introduce my uh, partners in here, but AB Tasty, they've done a fantastic job. Look at the scale, guys. 25 million sessions per day. 50 million events analyzed per day, and all done in 32 milliseconds. This is a scale. Now, Remy is gonna cover what they have done and their journey. Thank you for joining me here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I will try, and Sergey, I and Sergey will try to share a value in, the valuable insight uh, for you using uh, Google techno Technologies. Uh, to give you a bit of context, uh, AB Tasty is a platform for marketing and product team in order to personalize and uh, experiment and to personalize and to test on website or mobile app. So we work like a web analytics tool in terms of collecting data, and uh, we apply modification directly on the website, so we need real-time um, real technology in order to act on client website. So we will try to share this experience with you on a business perspective for me and on a technical perspective for Sergey. Uh, so if you are a technical guy, just stay here. Uh, you will have Sergey then. And, uh, and I hope it will help you to uh, implement your, uh, your technology. Just to give you the global context uh, of our work, uh, I would like to share with you uh, the most uh, powerful real-time technology I ever bought. Uh, that is to say, uh, my, uh, my daughter, uh, you can be sure that if a baby bottle comes around, you know it instantly. Uh, if you take these <laughs> jokes apart, this child uh, will grow up in uh, a world that we already called the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. So um, this is a world where uh, electronics meets uh, biology, biological aspects and meets as well digital aspects. Um, Ford used to say that uh, you can choose any Ford T uh, as long as it's black. The fact is, for the fourth industrial technology, we are the opposite of that. Uh, we are in a world where consumers uh, have multi-touch points with brands. They have those multi-touch points through multiple devices, so desktop, uh, mobile, watch, etc. cetera. Uh, they have communication with the brands through emails, phone, uh, through uh, chatbot as well. If your train is delayed, you will send a Twitter, uh, with, uh, with the brand uh, in the tweet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all uh, those brand has to build a one-to-one -one relationship at scale. Moreover, in this revolution, uh, the buying habits have changed a lot in the last five years uh, with the sharing economy, with uh, the subscri subscription model uh, through Slack, uh, through uh, Spotify, through Netflix, or, uh, or uh, sellers like that. So um, we have a more and more limitless access to uh, consume or to for consuming uh, products. So uh, things are going more and more fast uh, concerning payment. As well as uh, loyalty of the customer does not exist anymore. Uh, I mean, customer, you have today, you will have to convince them again in two years. Uh, for example, if there is someone having a tattoo uh, with uh, Arle Davidson in the room, just come to see me at the end uh, of the session. I offer you a bottle of champagne, but those kind <laughs> of loyalty doesn't exist anymore. And uh, as well, uh, a, a recent study from Ecosultancy told us that we have, as a brand, less than one second to convince, convince a consumer or to get his attention. So this is, uh, the context where uh, we we'll live as, uh, as a brand or as a company that sell product or as someone that wants to attract new customers. And uh, this is a lot of company are not prepared to, um, to be or to respond to this endless consumer, endless changing customer. So what, uh, what, what, what we offer or the companies that can't uh, change or that can adapt will just extinct. 
Let's take, for example, uh, Blockbuster DVD here in the US that disappeared uh, with the Netflix, or let's take that Borders libraries uh, with Amazon. So those companies that are not able to, um, to adapt to those new customer and those companies that are not able to make modification every minute uh, will disappear. We usually hear uh, companies that say, oh, I'm revamping my website, this is a two years project. We cannot have that anymore uh, on, on, the, on the society, or on the revolution we, we live. So there is a new way, new manner of consuming, and uh, we can say that companies like Netflix, Amazon, Uber have totally changed the way we consume, and they have uh, set a, a limit or they have set a minimum level uh, for customers that is very high, and all companies need to, uh, to adapt more quickly. Let's hear uh, a quick example around uh, those huge companies that succeed. Uh, they used to uh, experiment a lot with what we call the 1,000 experiment rule. Uh, and with, uh, there is a correlation between number of experiments you do and uh, your odds of success uh, as, as a company. This is where A-B testing comes in. Uh, in order to help brand and companies to better understand their user, to target them, to act directly on their website, on their mobile app, to analyze this traffic, and then to optimize uh, the whole process. So we help companies to uh, make modification every minute, every second on their website, and to uh, be the best at convincing clients. So for that, uh, we need to, uh, to go in real time and we need algorithms that will automatically display the right version for the right user. So here I just kept an example around, let's uh, take a title of an article. We have to determine in a second uh, which uh, article or which title will be, will be the best for, uh, for a user. It's exa exactly the same for a visual aspect of a website uh, on a travel website, for example. We have only a few seconds to determine if this user would like to have a travel around luxury stuff, around sport, or around cultural aspects, so we can adapt the visual on the website. So for all that, we implement algorithms that will uh, display the right version to the right person. I hope you all play this game when you were young, but we <laughs> do exactly the same at a large scale. Uh, we try to find the right person and to put in front the right message. And we try to do that uh, in a second. If you take another kind of personalization we do in real time, it's to be able to display the number of products which have been bought by the past and to convince people uh, that uh, they have to buy this product as well, so which is a personalization around product and not around users. And as well, we can do uh, less technical stuff, but just inverting steps in a process of uh, buying or in a process of subscribing stuff. Here is an example we did with UNICEF around inverting two steps of their, uh, of their form and we increased the revenue by 18% 18, 18 uh, with them. So um, to quickly uh, tell you about the company, we, are, uh, we have 750 clients, uh, 200 employees, six offices, uh, six countries, 14 offices, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have 100% growth uh, yearly since five years, and uh, we manage a huge, huge amount of data that uh, Sergey will uh, explain to you uh, in a minute. And we work with huge brands in order to optimize their website uh, at, in real time, uh, all day long, all year long. And uh, we, and that's it. So if your logo is not here, don't hesitate to come to see me at the end uh, of the session. Uh, <laughs> and we will go deeper in the technical <laughs> aspect uh, with Sergey that will come on stage uh, to explain to you how did we implement that uh, on, a, on a global scale level and uh, how did we partner with uh, Google to manage that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sergey. It's great to be here and uh, a little about me. I'm from Moscow. I live in Paris and I've been with Abitesti since uh, 2015. I'm also a Hadoop ecosystem enthusiast. I have 12 years of experience working with backend architectures. 
I work at a bit tasty as a head of foundation. Essentially, I manage the team that works on all the data processing and infrastructure aspects of our company. And as a part of technical team, I'm in charge of software architecture and application development. And uh, let, uh, let me tell you about the technical evolution of EB Tasty since uh, 2009 and what our next steps will be. Uh, so let's dive into this. Uh, in 2009, uh, what did EB Tasty technology stacks look like? Well, uh, Remy had uh, the idea uh, of developing an A-B testing tool and wanted to move quickly. So we built uh, our proof of concept in one week as a monolithic architecture with all the application, database, and infrastructure services on one virtual machine. At that point, we only had five small clients with a small load on our infrastructure. We had a few more 200 events per second and we only collected the data related uh, to our clients' campaigns. So this approach worked well until around 2012 when business started to boom. At this point, two things started happening. First, our clients saw an increase in traffic and second, their expectation increased. They wanted higher functionality and uh, most importantly, they wanted real-time analytics. Our monolithic approach was therefore no longer effective and uh, we started uh, to think about the right tools to satisfy our clients. We also started to experiment with uh, stream data processing and uh, at this stage uh, we had around 200 clients and a uh, little more than 2,000 events per second. And so in 2016, we tested different tools which would allow us to improve our B-Tasty's product and increase functionality, provide us with stability given the increase in client traffic and develop real-time analytics to meet client demands. We tested a range of tools, as you can see here, including Sparkstream, Kafka, Cassandra, but we found that uh, they were not adapted to our needs or cost-effective. And so in 2017 and uh, 2018, we tested the cl Google Cloud Platform, and uh, what we really liked was its open source approach uh, for me, for the developer, and uh, for my team. This is great in terms of documentation, constant improvement, and so on. And uh, also, from a business point of view, what Google Analytics does, it's very close to what we do. Therefore, we can use the same tools as Google Analytics like BigQuery, Dataflow, Bigtable, PubSub, and many others to reach the same level of performance which our clients like. Uh, and uh, so what is our approach today? Thanks to the CP and its data streaming services, we have changed our way of collecting the data. And while we only collected the data related to our clients' campaigns, now we collect all the visitor events, which enables us to develop new insights. And so today we can provide our clients with uh, some real-time analytics and uh, indicators. Uh, and finally, let's take a look uh, at our next steps. Uh, first, we predict uh, that the number of events processed per second will increase 15-fold due to the growth of EB testing. We expect to be able to scale our infrastructure accordingly using Google. <laughs> uh, second thing, uh, we have already started to process our data in different regions of the world, but tomorrow we want uh, to have the access points in Jest and the storage in different regions also close to where our clients are based, such as uh, South America, Australia, China, many other. And third thing, at, the, at present, we mainly provide our clients with insight as to how to improve their conversion rates. And tomorrow, we want to harness machine learning technology in order to improve this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we have a little bit of time. And I actually have some uh, 
questions in here for my partners, but we would like to hear from you as well. So that's why we save this time for ourselves to have some interactions with you, mm -hmm. your needs, and so forth. But to kick these things off, and I think there's mics in here. Please, if you have a mic uh, question, please just hop in there and ask the questions. And do we have any gifts for the best question? We can think of one. We can definitely think of one. All right, but I do have one question for both of you. So uh, what I understood is the personalization matters and those tweaks that you're making it. How does it change the business? How, how did it impact from what it was to what it is today and the, the results that you're seeing as the business CEO for your customers? Yeah, sure. Um, at the early beginning of the tool, um, small improvements were very impactful on, web, on client websites. So just changing the color of a button was enough or changing a wording was enough. The fact is, uh, with the maturity of clients, with uh, evolution of websites, etc., we have to be more and more impactful in what we offer uh, to our clients and in what our clients offer to their customer. I see. Uh, so we have to, that's why we have to implement new features like uh, image matchmaking, which is the fact of uh, displaying the right image to the right user. So we have to find a new way of catching the attention. And I would say that the increment that we could generate for our clients is between five to 15% increase of revenue during wow. a year, so that's pretty that's huge. Pretty yeah. good, I yeah. saw that example for UNICEF, that's 18% bump, that's pretty good, yeah. the decision that you guys made there. Sergey, you said, uh, what, 2019 to today, that's a big change, the scale is impressive. So tell us about the volumes of data that you're seeing, how did it change, what happens, what's the impact? Uh, as I said in my presentation, in 2009, we had our MVP built on monolithic architecture. Yeah. Uh, everything uh, like uh, data processing, uh, dashboard, database was on the same server. And uh, as the business expanded, uh, we built a relational database cluster to store visitors' data. And uh, we used this approach uh, for about two years, but it's not perfect <laughs> <laughs> for our needs. And uh, so we, we constructed now a scale uh, data store architecture uh, with uh, some Apache uh, Spark jobs in bike mm -hmm. mode uh, that we host on virtual machines uh, and uh, administrate ourselves. And it was very painful in terms of maintenance. So one year ago, we migrated over to Google and uh, okay. we are really satisfied. We had a look yesterday with uh, Sergey about the amount of data we have, and we made a calculation that every six months we double the size of the data storage we have. So the increase of uh, volume we ingest is very important. Very yeah. important. Okay, very good. So I highlighted several times that batch and streaming and how having the same set of code, same sort of tools is important. Can you share with our guests in here what that impact was. You know, when you used to do it with batch, now you're doing it real time with streaming and you didn't have to change much of your code there. What was the impact from business side as well as yeah. from your technology side? From a business side, it was more problems than a solution. I mean, um, when you do batch and the time lapse you have to process the batch is uh, less than the time you need to process the batch, at some point you are stuck. So uh, we had trouble by uh, trouble to compute those batch and to um, and to to give a good experience for our own clients. So that's why we tried to stream as much as we could all uh, all the aspect of the tool. Uh, and in terms of uh, personalization that I show you in the example, we cannot do that with batch as we have to be able to uh, categorize the user and give a new user experience after the first page seen by the user. So in batch, you cannot do that. You as do that. People will uh, switch from a first page to the second page in less than five seconds. Yeah. So we have to calculate that in, in real time. Yeah. I see. Okay. Anything from your perspective? Oh, yes. But uh, for the clients, I think also uh, we can target our visitors in real time based on their current behavior when we use the batch mode. And it's complicated. Okay. And from a technical point of view, of view uh, for me, batch processing is more painful to administrate. It requires us to manage job sc scheduling, and uh, it requires also more computing resource. 
and because we process much more data at once. Okay, okay, well thank you.